Hi, this is Daniel Hartz, host of the Sustainability Matters Today podcast. We have some exciting news. On June 22nd, we'll be changing the name of our podcast from Sustainability Matters Today to Sustainability Champions. The reason for the change is because the new name Sustainability Champions better captures what we're going for, highlighting the people, ideas, and innovations that are pr protecting and healing the planet. Thank you for your support and interest in our work so far. We look forward to producing high quality podcast episodes and social media materials under the new name, Sustainability Champions. Please join us in showcasing these incredible individuals and the great work they're doing. By the way, do you know a sustainability champion you'd like to nominate to be on the podcast? Reach out to me at daniel at sustainabilitychampions.com to let me know. Thank you very much. Now back to your regularly scheduled podcast. I'm joined by Oliver Walker-Jones, Head of Communications for Lilium. Thank you so much for joining me, Oliver. Hey, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. My pleasure as well. And the way I like to start these conversations is just by asking what is the problem that Lilium is solving? So it kind of depends who you are. But if we imagine that we live in a world where we increasingly live in cities, there are more and more of us living in cities, which poses a couple of problems. First is a problem of congestion. Mm. But second, and perhaps more importantly, it's a problem of pollution as well. Um, you know, we all want to move in the same direction. We all want to go to the same place. And that becomes increasingly difficult. Pair that with the environmental uh, pressures that come from traveling, particularly around carbon emissions, yeah. then what we saw was the opportunity to deliver a new form of transport. So that form of transport allows you to travel around in ways that you perhaps hadn't thought of before. And it and, and particularly allows you to do two things. The first is to take some of that pressure off the roads and the streets that we have. So a slightly more pleasurable experience to travel, but more importantly, it's, it's entirely emissions free. So the Lilium jet is a fully electric, carbon free or emissions free aircraft so we at one point we reduce uh, the pressure on the streets and the second we reduce the pressure on the environment and then there's a there's a kind of a third benefit that comes from that if you do that and you do it successfully what it allows you to do with the range of the aircraft is to connect places that haven't been connected before and that's really kind of a, the, the coolest benefit for me i think is you can take these villages and towns that sit around big urban centers and make them as well connected um, as those cities have been before yeah, I think that last point and all of those three things are really interesting. Um, and I, I, I want to make sure we get to talk about all of them. That last point, I think, is in my mind, uh, or in some ways, I think the most interesting of them all, because in order to connect remote places or even places that may not necessarily be remote, but just not as easy to get to, mm -hmm. um, you, you really need to create a lot of transportation links, whether it's um, roads or railroads or... Actually, I'm not sure. I think that might be it. Or I guess flying uh, on a standard plane. Sure. But if we're looking at roads and, and railroads, um, they're quite destructive to the environment. I mean, you really need to like just slice out land. Yeah, and... yeah, absolutely. So it, it's, uh, it's tunnels, it's bridges, it's roads, it's railways. Um, what we, what we, the way we like to talk about it is connecting the unconnected. So there mm. are towns and villages all around developed countries, undeveloped countries where they don't have the connection that they want. And the reason for that is because it's too expensive. And like you say, it's too expensive, not just on the environment. You know, it, yeah. it costs you hundreds of acres of woods or, or natural habitat with a, with a train line or a tunnel or a road. But it's also expensive on the public purse, right? It costs billions of pounds or dollars or euros to build those connections. So what we're able to do with minimum amount of infrastructure is to connect places with a high speed connection that haven't had it before. So all you need essentially to connect them is, is a landing pad at the beginning and a landing pad at the end um, and nothing in between. So no road, no rail, no carbon, no concrete, nothing to connect them. Yeah, I think that's that's so interesting. So. Uh, we've, we're talking, we're kind of alluding to landing pads, jets. Um, so how exactly, well, you've already mentioned how you're solving the problem, but what, what exactly is it that we're talking about? So we, what, what we have is the Lilium jet. And the Lilium jet was, a, was an idea that came from uh, our founder and CEO, uh, Daniel Vegan. He pulled together a team of four co-founders um, and they decided to introduce a new form of transport. And broadly speaking, that's it's, it's an aircraft or a flying taxi, as some people like to call mm. it. It's a five seater aircraft. So that's one pilot and four passengers. It takes off and lands vertically. So a bit like a helicopter. 
but then it flies forwards like a normal aircraft. So it does this kind of transition movement where it kind of goes up and then it travels forwards. And that means you can have all the kind of benefits of flying forwards, which is high speed and high efficiency, but without the need for runways and airports, all you need is the, is the simple landing pad. So it's all electric. It travels up to 300 kilometers an hour by the time we've developed and matured the technology and brought it to market. Uh, and it does that on a single charge in about an hour. Yeah, that's that's really incredible. And so on, on each side of, so you have to have these actual landing pads, right? You can't just land in like my my garden or front yard. Or yeah, something. for the time being, we're, we're talking about specific landing pads that have technology that allow the aircraft to land and also have charging points. And in terms of sound, I mean, well, I, I guess before we we jump into sound specifically, where would these landing pads be? I mean, do you have to have like, would it ne need to be next to airports like Heathrow? Or... Yeah, so I think um, you can you can broadly build them wherever you want, as long as the safety considerations taken into account. They can be on the ground, they can be up on top of buildings, and, and where we imagine um, they're likely to appear in the in, at least in the first years of service is that they would be where you see large densities of people already. So shopping centres, conference centres, train stations, airports. So London Heathrow to Kings Cross St Pancras train station is a really good example of the sort of journey you might make. Um, but that kind of opens up another area, which is what I think is one of the most fascinating parts of this, is people feel like what you're going to do with these aircrafts is jump from your house to the supermarket down the road, and it's going to be like five minutes. And we don't really see that as a, as a huge opportunity, because you can already travel on the ground, and that's really quite efficient on short journeys like that. Right. And you don't really want to travel to a landing pad, get in an aircraft, go up, go down, get out. So what we see is actually, yeah, he threw to London city centre might make sense, but actually with the range of the aircraft that we have, you can travel from London Heathrow Airport to Manchester or Cardiff or Southampton. You know, we're talking about those kind of regional air mobility routes mm -hmm. rather than just urban ones. And we think that's where we make the most difference. So that could be like New York, Boston in one hour. Yeah. Or... Yeah, and so that's a really great example. New York Boston works because um, it's just right at the edge of that kind of 300 kilometer range. So I think it's probably something for once we have a really mature established service. But what it means is if you start in downtown Manhattan, you don't have to take one hour out to JFK Airport. You don't wait an hour and a half to check in for your flight, get on the thing, go to Boston, then go into the city center. We take you point to point, right? somewhere in the middle of the city to somewhere in the middle of the city. And we do that in an hour of flight. So you save yourself a significant amount of time and the carbon that you would have used on the flight and in the car even getting to yeah. the airport. Yeah, it's incredible. So, and just from a human benefit, I mean, I've noticed that even if you do one of these like short flights, the, I think the shortest I've ever been on is maybe like 35 or 45 minutes. That whole journey is just so exhausting. Even, yeah, right. I mean, even if you leave like at 10 a.m., and you land at you know ten forty five or eleven forty five if you're going ahead an hour or something like that. By the end of it, you're just tired, and it's like yeah, half yeah. the day's we, gone. Exactly right. We want to take that that pressure away from people. We want to make traveling easier, not not just because it's an indulgence. You know, and this is an important point for us, right? We're not trying to deliver something that's a luxury for people to do because it's nice. It it actually serves an important purpose too. But in in designing a service that's flexible and easy for people, we want to make it so that it's an enjoyable experience. It doesn't feel like like the experience that we all have at the airport, which is painful and slow and, and kind of irritating, actually. And like you say, you end up tired at the yeah. end of it. And by the way, those regional flights, it's something like 5% of all of the CO2 from flights comes from flights that are under 500 kilometers wow. uh, in distance. And we're talking about delivering an aircraft, which at entry into service would have 300 kilometers. And, you know, as battery technology increases, that can go up. So, you know, it's possible to get to like four or 500 maybe in the future. So if we can take that 5% away, you're talking something like uh, it's about a billion tons of CO2 that the, the, the airline industry has in total. And if we can take 5% of that away already, that's a really, really big CO2 saving that comes just from using these sort of aircraft. And again, that, that, CO2 emissions that you're talking about is strictly the planes flying. Yeah. Like you said, it's yeah. not about driving to and from the airport. It's not about all yeah. the emissions that come from potentially having to build roads um, to reach these places. Or if you're planning on driving from, uh, you know, London, Manchester or New York, Boston. Yeah. You're, you're talking specifically just about the flight. So yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Now it's possible that you, you know, in some routes you're going to need, 
rail links or you're going to need road links, super high density routes or ones where there's lots of land based heavy freight, for example, freight mm -hmm. railways, you know, we're not taking that away. Right. But what we are providing is something which may compete with lesser used routes or, or less dense routes or routes that just don't exist today. Um, so we want to be able to enable travel and where possible to take carbon off the road or off the rail. And we think yeah. that's entirely possible. I think that's a really cool. Uh, it's a really cool idea. And, and one thing that I heard Daniel speaking about was removing the visual traffic as well of cars going by and yeah and the noise right yeah the noise so so pollution is is a, is a kind of if you think about the sustainability of any form of transport it's not just the carbon right it's the noise it's the sound it's the visual pollution that you get you know we we all when, when they introduced the cars people said you know we, we don't want cars we don't we don't want them bustling up our roads they'll be noisy they'll be polluting and yet we all use them every day and they drive past our house every day and, and yeah. we've just totally accepted that now you know our, our aircraft isn't silent but what we are doing is designing something which is as quiet as it possibly can be and to put that into context it's going to be multiple 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 times quieter than a helicopter so you know it, it's not comparable in any way in terms of the sound print of a helicopter and the sound footprint what we want to achieve is something which blends into the background noise of a city so if you imagine you're standing at waterloo train station this thing lands on the building next to you you're not going to hear it. it's not going to add to the background noise and of course, as soon as it rises up in the air and gets high enough, you, you're not going to hear it as it flies overhead either. So we're, getting, we're targeting something that is entirely acceptable and it has to be acceptable from a noise perspective. But of course, as soon as it's up, you don't really hear it at all. And then you don't have the road passing in front of your house. You don't have hundreds of cars and lorries every hour going past. And we think that makes a difference. There's a question that some people have about you know, what will this look like in the skies? Are we going to see traffic jams in the skies yeah. instead of traffic jams on the ground? Um, the first thing to say to that, I think, is that, of course, the, the sky is three-dimensional, right? The, one of the main problems with the road is you're kind of stuck in this narrow channel, whereas in the sky, you can work in three dimensions, this way, this way, but also this way. So you can separate aircraft. There are also rules about the separation of aircraft. And if you think of the density and the speed, if we're traveling at up to 300 kilometers an hour and you've got five people in each one, actually, you can spread them out over a pretty pretty high, pretty, pretty wide distance before you get the same density that you get in a typical road scenario. You know, the average car has something like 1.2 um, people sitting in it at any one mm -hmm. time, right? Whereas we want to be running this at much higher capacity. So we take fewer vehicles to do it. They move quicker. They have greater distances. You don't get traffic jams in the sky. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, the more we're talking about it, the more it reminds me of the Jetsons. I don't yeah. Know <laughs> right. This is, this is exactly from my childhood. The, the moment when, uh, when William called me and said, Hey, you know, do you fancy doing this, uh, coming, coming, doing something like this? And I'm like, Oh, this is, this is just like the Jetsons or all, all the fifth element. Right. And the only difference is really that uh, it doesn't land in your back garden. At least yeah. not yet. N not yet. Yeah. That's really awesome. So how, um, uh, so in terms of the capacity, you mentioned that you want to really increase capacity beyond 1.2 people well, compared to a car. Yeah. So I guess that first, the question is, how does the actual or how will the booking work? So how do I, how do I yeah. get a plane? Yeah. So uh, first thing to say is we don't plan to um, introduce this for customer service until 2025. So uh, I can't show you the app today, but what we imagine and what we're planning for, and we already have a team working on this kind of stuff, mm. um, is that you'll, you'll take out your cell phone, your mobile phone, um, and you will identify the destination that you want to travel to. You book a flight and probably in the first years of service, it's a little bit more scheduled or it's a little, it's a little less on demand. Um, whilst we kind of, once we get the number of aircraft up and whilst we get the routes up, um, but you you'll say, hey, look, you know, there's a, there's a departure in half an hour from the pad that's like half a mile down the street. So you'll you'll book it on your phone. Um, you'll get to the landing pad. You'll check in. We're trying to do that in a digital, seamless way. So there's no need for kind of difficult processes when you arrive. It should be as simple as coming um, and maybe getting on a bus. You know, which which tends to be uh, yeah. much more simple than you know going to an airport, for example, or even simpler than a train. Um, you get on the aircraft, you fly to your destination, and and probably along the way we'll build in, and uh, we like the idea of building in last mile, first mile solution as well, so that there's connectivity at both ends for your journey. What's last mile, first mile? So um, the first mile of your journey and the last mile. Obviously, we um, 
we're going to take you 300 kilometers through the air. But there's this kind of last little bit of your journey, right, from your house to the pad or the pad to your office or the pad to your grandmother's house. We want, we want to help solve that as well. So it's kind of seamless for customers. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. So potentially some sort of like Lilium taxi, actual taxi service or yeah, maybe who knows? Yeah. Well, the, you have plenty of time to figure it out. Um, <laughs> That's for sure. And so the the capacity in terms of, and I, and I know that this is all relatively theoretical, but just to visualize it, um, there's four passengers that can be in it because the fifth one is a pilot. So you mentioned like a bus, meaning I might be sharing it with three other strangers or in theory, four of us, like a, a party of four can all book one uh, one one thing. And so the, the idea is really for them to fly at capacity. Yeah, I mean, it's the most efficient way to do it. It's it's better for all parties if that if that's the way that it operates. And we think by offering it, uh, kind of the way that we envisage the services, that's how it it will work. So, we're talking about four passengers, one pilot, and that that's mainly because um, at least to start with in 2025. Um, the regulation, you know, we've, we've got to get through regulatory hurdles to get to this into the into service, but um, the regulation won't exist then to have autonomous flight. You know, our, our grand ambition is to take this to the point where you actually don't have a pilot at all. So you have five passenger seats. And that's not as science fiction as it sounds. We, we have a team of people led by an amazing guy we recruited who was at Audi before running their, their automated driving wow. team. You know, he's, we're already there. You know, we, we, have a, we have this cool drone setup that we use to test the equipment. So, so it's cool. not that far away, right? But you have, you have to do a lot of testing and a lot of regulatory change to allow it to happen. So we will get to five passengers. Um, but to start with, like you say, four people. And we would like to operate at a capacity. It's a better business model. It's better operationally for everybody. And sure, you'll have to you'll have to share your flight with somebody. Um, but you know, I think that's probably one of the realities that comes out of the coronavirus thing. You know, I think we we all recognise that although we don't want to be too close together, um, that we need to share things. You know, a sustainable world is one where we share things more than we have done in the past. Yeah, and I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if if you kind of look at this um as more of a public transportation service rather than something that's reserved for the elite then yeah when you when you kind of look at it that way then all of a sudden it makes sense completely I, why wouldn't i share a public transportation service with you know three or four other people yeah it's it's kind of somewhere between an uber pool and a bus right yeah <laughs> and yeah airbus but i, I guess you can't really say that <laughs> somebody yeah. somebody already took that one huh? yeah exactly it's a it's a clever name um what I'd love to do is to actually go through briefly uh, sharing my screen here. And if you wouldn't mind mm -hmm. just talking, talking us through or talking me through the, um, the actual jet, because it looks so cool. Um, yeah. Just keep in mind that um, not everyone is going to be seeing this. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of describing sure. some of the things we're looking at. <clears throat> So what we see is uh, the Lilium jet. It's a five-seater aircraft. It has four wings in total. So that's two sets of wings at the front and two sets of the, one set of wings at the front, one set of wings at the back. Um, and those wings at the front are shorter. They're called okay. canard wings. Um, <clears throat> and they each have uh, flaps on them. So all four wings have flaps. Mm -hmm. um, and on those flaps are engines. They're very small electric jet engines kind of roughly the size of your, I guess, kind of roughly the size of your head is, oh, wow. is a good way to describe it. Um, and those engines each um, each rotate. So on those wings, they can point forwards or they can point down and they, they kind of skip between the two. So when you get ready for takeoff, those engines point downwards. Yeah. And we turn the engines on and they pump air down towards the ground, which lifts the aircraft up off the ground. And then they slowly start to tilt forwards to the point at which you're basically traveling horizontally because they're pushing you forwards like thrust on a on a normal jetliner. Huh. So the passengers sit in the in the in the middle of the aircraft. The pilot obviously sits at the front. Large panoramic windows for you to make sure that you can see uh, what's going on around you. And you know, no matter how our design of the aircraft develops as we get closer to market entry, we kind of consider that the the joy of flying is a really important part of this. So we we put the customer experience at the center. So maybe the windows get smaller, they get bigger, but we we want you to really enjoy flying in this aircraft um, and yeah. more so than you do in any other one. So that's kind of an important point to us is kind of the customer interface in all of this. It's been at the center of why we've designed it. It's very, very streamlined um, and it lacks a couple of features which you'd expect from an aircraft, right? You kind of, you look at this and you think, wait, it, you know, it doesn't have a, a tail, you know, yeah. kind of the, the tall bit that stands at the That's end true. of a normal aircraft. Yeah, it's more of um, a water droplet shape, really. 
Yeah, yeah. Sort right, of. That's better than, some people say egg, um, but I'll go with water droplets, more beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the tail typically provides stability for an aircraft, right? Um, but what we have, because we have 36 engines and you can change which ones are giving you which amount of energy, um, you can actually give all of that control that a tail used to give you without the need for the tail which means that you can have a much simpler aircraft. It makes it cheaper to produce. It makes it cheaper to operate. It makes it safer in many respects because it, it doesn't have as much complexity. So That's in incredible. everything we have, we have redundancy. And this kind of comes onto the safety point. You know, people look at this and they think, well, small airplanes or helicopters, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, we all know a story about helicopters and, and safety, but mm. what, we've, what we've been really keen to do as we've designed this aircraft is to build in redundancy. So there are 36 engines. So if one of them fails or two of them fails, you've got 35 or 34 more. There are 12 flaps that move the engines or tilt the engines. So you take one or two of those away, you've still got plenty of controllability of the aircraft. Inside the computer system that controls them, obviously the pilot doesn't have 36 little thrust levers, you know, yeah. so that there's a lot of computer involvement, but that computer is triple redundant. So everywhere we've, everywhere we've gone with this, we've put, redundancy into the system to make sure it's safe and we'll be certifying it with those authorities that certify commercial aircraft that you go in today so this will be on a par in terms of safety with those aircraft so considerably considerably safer than a than a helicopter because it has much more redundancy so you're talking about as far as certification it would be like the faa yeah the faa in the us and ars are in europe and these are just the I mean, I'm familiar with the FAA. I'm, I'm not familiar with the European one, um, other than what you just said. But that, sure. that's what actually certifies. Yeah. So if you want airline. to, if you want to take um, a passenger in an aircraft and you want them to pay, you have to have that aircraft certified by the relevant regulatory authority. Mm -hmm. And in each country, that authority exists. Um, in some areas, they're kind of grouped together. So in Europe, you have the AASA organization. And in the US, you have the FAA. And what they do is they set standards. They, they decide, rather than us, they decide what makes an aircraft safe and, and what, what, what you have to achieve in order for an aircraft to be okay to fly passengers who are paying to come in your aircraft. So we've already started the conversations with those people. We're in the process of working out how we get to the point where we have an aircraft that is certified and obviously we have to do that before we can enter service yeah. but those conversations have been really good and actually one of the things we've taken away has been how positive those regulatory bodies have been in helping progress you know i think they mm -hmm. see the opportunity that this this sort of new transport system provides and they haven't been kind of traditional or old-fashioned or slow I mean, of course they're safe but they've been really embracing of this sort of technology to help us get to where we want to be in on the time scales that we want to get fantastic yeah i mean i can imagine that you can get pretty uh bogged down in bureaucracy with large bodies like that, that yeah and you know and to some extent there's, there's a reason why aerospace has a reputation a bit like that because it, it is a slow purposefully slow industry because it is the safest right yeah. the, the safety standards you get in the aerospace sector are much much higher than they are on the roads or the rails or any other form of transport um, and that's a standard that we'll continue to hold yeah, with this it, new form of transport uh, it reminds me of um i'm a big fan and this is uh, just an admission that i'm not sure that uh will paint me in a good light but i absolutely love the film dumb and dumber and i don't know if you remember <laughs> but there's a part where he's driving uh mary to the airport and he says you know statistically you're more likely to get into a car crash on the way to the airport absolutely yeah yeah um, and it's true so not only, you know, if we take cars off the road, we're not just taking the carbon off, we're, we're making things safer as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's really cool. And so in terms of the, the pricing, I mean, we kind of touched upon this idea of it being um, kind of like public transportation. So yeah. is that the, or perhaps, um, you know, we're talking about flying, so public transportation of flying. So what, what would the pricing structure look like? So this depends a few, on a few different things, right? The first is how far you're traveling. Um, and the second is how long we've been operating for and how mature a service is, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a, a typical um, a typical development, I think, with anybody introducing a new service. So where we want to get to, kind of the end point, is that we, we are absolutely committed, and our founders are really committed to this point, that it's not supposed to be something that you develop just for the elite. It's not luxury. It's not just for people that can afford to fly in a helicopter today. I don't know about you, but that's not me. No. Right. Uh, I don't fly, I'm flying a helicopter every day. Um, so we don't want to do that. What we want to do is to create something which is accessible, 
almost democratically accessible. So mm. everyone should, if they're traveling today, be able to afford it in the same way. So if you take, for example, a journey from JFK airport to downtown Manhattan, that's kind of a, it's an hour in an Uber, give or take, um, maybe a little bit more. And that's going to cost you today roughly kind of $70. Um, and we would imagine um, that it, once we're going or at full scale, that that's a price point that we can get to as well with the aircraft. Um, now, if you look at slightly longer journeys, obviously the price will go up a little bit. So if you're talking New York to Boston, we don't, you're not going to compete with the taxi over that distance. You're going to be competing with people taking regional flights. So at that point, we want to compete with those kind of journeys. If you're talking about train, there's kind of like middle distance as well. Um, it might be a little bit more expensive than your standard train ticket, maybe more like a first class train ticket, mm -hmm. but we still want to be able to be competitive. Now, of course, the, 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 the easiest bit of competition is the time saving because we're going to save you a significant amount of time on any journey that you take that's over kind of 30 or 40 kilometers. Um, but in every case, we also want to be price competitive. It's an end goal. So, you know, maybe not on day one, but we want to get there. Yeah, I think it makes sense. And I imagine, like you said, as you scale up and this becomes bigger and bigger, um, uh, there's no reason why, in my mind at least, that the price can't start getting yeah, lower. And let me let me put it in a different way. Um, if we connect 10 towns in, in, in a country, so let's just say the north of England, for example, you look at high speed two, the rail connection, and then high speed three or two B and three, um, then you're talking about connecting lots of towns in Manchester and, and Birmingham and Derby and Sheffield and Nottingham. Um, then well, those cities, you know, we could connect them at a reasonable price. But look, if, the, if it means the government don't have to invest 10 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion pounds in investing in putting a train track on what might be lower density routes, and we can cover that density with aircraft, then why not subsidize it too? You know, there's, there's an opportunity there for mm -hmm. um, governments to think about or consider funding it as well, I think, to some extent. Yeah, it's a really good point. And, and again, it comes back to that original idea of uh, it's not just the the money of the government that you'll be saving it's also the the environment too because there i've yeah. been seeing a lot in terms of this hs2 going from birmingham to london they're going to have to wipe out several really ancient forests in order to to build it and there's a lot of yeah. kind of like you know what do we do it's so important for the economy and for the people uh, mm. and also we have these ancient forests so it's like which one yeah <laughs> so I think I mean London to Birmingham is a difficult one because it's such a it's such a high density route that you probably yeah. need something that can take thousands of passengers once every few minutes. But on those kind of those slightly less dense routes, which is almost any other route, I think yeah, yeah. you start to think, well, you know, the benefit could really be from a different form of transport, and that's what inspired our founders. You know, right back at the beginning, they they looked at you know, Daniel tells the story as our CEO. Uh, he's he's. I don't know, 34, 35, he was a university, technical university in Munich, and he came up with this idea. He looked at the Osprey, which is a, it's a military aircraft that takes off and lands vertically. Mm -hmm. It's really noisy, it's really inefficient, um, but it proves the concept, right? That you can do this kind of flying. You know, his idea was, you know, what if you can use this for public transport? What if you can get the public doing this and doing it with electric, right? Because you know, there are lots of companies looking at electric flight and it, it has to be the future for us. You know, I think it, it's kind of almost irresponsible to consider developing any kind of transport now that's not electric. You know, yeah. you, we're going to struggle to get across the Atlantic Ocean electrically for decades. But, but those regional journeys, and maybe we want to do more regional journeys, by the way, in the future. You know, if, if you have this opportunity to travel within your country at high speed, maybe you don't need to go across the Atlantic so often or, or into, into Europe. Or, you know, maybe maybe it, it opens up a whole new paradigm of where people live and where they holiday. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it kind of reminds me of how, like, with um, when Uber came about, it, I, I've heard stories about how different pockets of cities started to just open up because yeah. it was so much easier to get there. You didn't have to really think about parking or driving, or especially in like in a place like Los Angeles, which is where I'm originally from. There's just parts of LA that would be such a pain to get to. But yeah. with Uber, it doesn't matter. It's someone else's problem and, and you're paying them a little bit to do it for you, which is great. And then you can drink and enjoy and you don't have to worry about any of that. And then, I think the same kind of rule applies here with regional. Yeah. Yeah. And LA is, is probably the case study for this sort of yeah. transport. Right? We, we all see like the interstate traffic that you get kind of in and out of the city every day. You know, LA is a really good example. Yeah. By the way, what are the uh, interiors of the planes like? <laughs> so uh, it's still under wraps, actually. So okay. we, we, have a, we have a really a really amazing team of people um, who work on the exterior and interior design. Obviously, you start with the exterior and yeah. then you kind of go backload the insides. Um, 
they're award-winning by the way we we, we just won the uh, red dot luminary award for the design of the aircraft which is like the design award and we're, we're really so proud cool. of our team yeah Congratulations. Uh, well yeah thanks thanks uh, and it's led by a guy called thomas who again is you know he's kind of like i don't know 30 something he's a you know home with his he's got a young baby you know like it's really cool that these guys can deliver this, you know, this amazing quality of stuff. Anyway, um, so the so the outside of the aircraft is beautiful. We want to replicate that inside. We want it to be a different experience from traveling on a typical aircraft. It's going to feel more like a car because of the seating arrangement. Mm -hmm. And then it's only five seats. Um, it's, it, you know, whether it's tall enough to stand up in or not depends a little bit on how the aircraft develops. But um, we want it to feel like a different service. Um, Beyond that, uh, we, we have a design studio. I've seen inside it. It looks really exciting, but you're going to have to wait until probably next year before I can tell you more about the interior. Cool. Can't wait to hear it. Sounds really good. I'm sure it is. Uh, if if what you're saying is that it it's going to be designed in a similar way that the outside was, then I'm sure it's going to be spectacular. Um, I hope so. Yeah, but and something else, another really piece, a really good piece of news is that on the twenty third of March, so just a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago, time of recording, you closed two hundred forty million dollars in funding. That's amazing! Yeah. congratulations Thanks. on that. Yeah, too. it was uh, that was really exciting for us. I think we um, we've been well funded kind of from the start. You know, we we had some great funding early on from a guy called. Frank Talon, who is um, one of the Dragon's Den kind of guys in Germany, cool. he's, he's a bit of a celebrity there. And he, he with a couple of other great investors, put that kind of seed funding in. Mm -hmm. um, then we went on to raise a Series A and a Series B um, from some, some really great venture capital funds uh, all around the world, but particularly Atomico in London. Mm -hmm. um, and then LGT and Liechtenstein, but most recently it came from Tencent, which is a big Chinese company. Um, they do lots of stuff that probably... Your listeners know, um, but they invested back in our Series C, um, which took us to like 100 million, a Series B, sorry, took us to like 100 million. And then we just raised this big chunk of money, another 240 million, gives us enough security to really get this aircraft up to the point when we're ready for serial production, right? We have two big manufacturing halls. We finished the outside of the buildings. We need to kit them out now so we can get ready for serial production. But this gives us a lot of um, what you call in the venture capital word runway. So the kind of the length of time you have as a business, of course, for a company that, that specifically doesn't need runway, it's a difficult term, but it gives us significant runway and it's really exciting. It makes us Europe's best funded company in this space, it makes us one of Germany's 10 most valuable startups, I think. So it's really, uh, it's really good Super news. Cool. For us. Mm. That's awesome. So the, the funds are going to be used to actually uh, mostly focus on large scale production then. Yeah, so what, there are two things we really need to do right now, which is to take the aircraft that we have today, which is a kind of a prototype, um, and develop that into the point when it's ready for serial production. So it, it'll need to change and adapt slightly, and that'll come as we continue doing the flight testing that we're doing at the moment. Once we've done that and we have a serial production aircraft, then we need to be ready pretty much instantly to turn that production on right. so that we can get to market quickly. And that's what this money will pay for. Yeah, that's really cool. Any ideas on when that's actually going to be when full-scale production starts yeah well we uh we we've always promised that we will enter the market in 2025 mm -hmm. so we plan to start operations in two or three locations simultaneously give or take around the world in 2025 so we need the aircraft by then <laughs> Got it. and that really depends on how quickly you can build them so i would say kind of nine 12 12 to nine months probably before then oh we'll, wow. we'll turn okay. the industrial capacity it. start turning it up a bit yeah it makes sense when when's going to be the first manned flight so this prototype that we have at the moment um, isn't going to be manned. We actually fly it from the ground. So um, we have fully trained pilots that are used to flying in the aircraft, but they're, they're down on the ground kind of with a control deck and they, they do it from the ground because it's safer, right? Yep. Um, and if you can take the risk out, then, then why not do that? So this specific prototype won't be manned. So we need to get through to our next one. So watch this space. Uh, it depends a little bit on when we can actually get our teams back and doing test flying, because obviously at the moment we're all we're all working from home. Um, but uh, when, when, when we get back, then we'll start continue our flight testing. You continue that. You you complete the flight testing. So the um, the Lilium jet that you can see flying on our website or our YouTube channel yep. is flying at about 100 kilometers an hour today. That's kind of the max speed that we're at at the moment. We need to get that up to 200 plus. We need to do kind of longer missions and slightly more complex maneuvers. And once we kind of proved the aircraft does everything that we want, then we, we start kind of working on the next iteration. And that's kind of the point when we'll get to man flight, I think, Makes with the sense. next iteration. 
a question that I just thought of in terms of um, because you're you are in the airspace and you know you will be sharing air with yeah. real planes like like it I is should, a real plane I know I was about to say <laughs> I, I, I take it back with uh, uh, planes that use jet fuel um, uh -huh. and commercial aircrafts um, uh, do you need to work with an air traffic control to... Yeah, so this, um, th this is an area that's really well understood at the moment um, and one that we're working really closely with the authorities on. So, mm -hmm. yes, there needs to be coordination of airspace. Um, it depends which bit of airspace you're in. So a lot of the airspace in the world um, is, is uncontrolled. So you can fly through that without, without needing like you know, flight corridors or, or controls from people telling you to go up or go down or go left I or see. right. You know, most of the airspace you fly in is uncontrolled. Um, but in those areas where it is controlled, then obviously you will need to interact with the normal facilities that a, that a jetliner would today. So a really good example of that is if you fly um, from a small village into let's say so somewhere in Surrey and you fly into Heathrow Airport just as an example right. you know the, obviously everything is very much coordinated in and around a big airport like that so you will need to coordinate but some of the stuff that's over the countryside much much less so you still need to file flight plans and things but um like the certification of the aircraft the regulation is actually is, is basically it's all there you know the, the, there's no new regulation required to do this so it's just a question of how we integrate making sure we have the right tools the right people the right capabilities to integrate makes sense so the end well that's actually really good news in that case you don't need to like invent anything you're just integrating right. yourself into exactly it. Now, if you fast forward 20 years and everybody's taken up this technology and we're all flying everywhere and things start to get a little bit busier, then maybe there are changes that have to happen and things have to be a bit more controlled, but certainly for the first few years of services. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And um, thank you very much for explaining all of that. It's such an exciting service. One one question I, I love to ask, um, just because yeah. you, you're busy uh, on a day-to-day -day basis working on being you know, sustainable with your, with this electric plane. What do you personally do on a day-to-day -day basis to be environmentally friendly, whether you're at home, which I know you pretty much have to be right now, uh, yeah. or when you do go to the office uh, at some point in hopefully the very near future, uh, what, what kind of things, you know, do you do? So you can do, probably tell from my accent that I'm uh, I'm a Brit, right? Living in in Germany, and and for me, I love Germany. It's a really great country to live in. But there are some things um, that I've learned along the way, I think. And so the the first is um, Munich is a beautiful city. It's also really really flat. Mm. Um, so I've uh, I've bought myself a bike, uh, and my daughter and I cycle around a lot. She sits in the trailer in the back. So we we use our bikes much more than we use the cars. And I used to live in the Peak District in the UK, so I couldn't oh, really beautiful. cycle anywhere because it was well, yeah, it's beautiful, but it's really hilly. Yeah. Um, so now it's flat. I cycle. Um, then we have um, we have a really uh, you know, <laughs> the German 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 culture loves meat, like big heavy meat. But um, there's a strong uh, vegetarian vegan movement as well. Um, and at Lilium, we provide people with meals three times a day, but we um, all all of the meals two days a week are vegan, vegetarian, um, and then every evening as well. So uh, I've actually kind of this has been a big step for me as well. It's kind of moving into that understanding that actually you know, the carbon footprint of the meat that you eat. Um, so I, I'm I'm eating much less meat, and I'm being a little bit more uh, outdoorsy with my bicycle, uh, which is all kind of like a way of reflecting German culture too. Yeah, that's that's really cool, and I think those are both really important areas to focus on is transportation, as as you do, and, and of course the food that that we eat. Um, well, Oliver, thank you very much for your time, and for for people who are interested in learning more about Lilium and following you, I mean, people I'm sure may want to be booking flights already. It's probably a little too <laughs> early, but when 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 um, when you are at that point, where can people find you and, and learn more about? So you'll be this? able to find everything that you ever want to know about Lilium at our website. So it's www.lilium.com. That's L-I-L-I-U-M.com. And we also have all the usual social channels. So we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. You can find us there. We, we, we try to be, um, we try to share as much as we can because um, we recognize partly there's a lot of interest in it, but it, it's also just really cool to look at. And I'd encourage anybody to go check the flight videos particularly because it, it's somehow difficult to understand and really explain what this, until you see it kind of yeah. hanging in midair you really kind of get a sense of it so go, go check out the videos i i do recommend the videos um and the website uh, as well because there's it's so interesting to watch how this thing takes off and slowly and very gracefully just starts moving forward uh without Thanks. any yeah without it, it's just so elegant and it just does it without really any 
any hiccups at all. Um, yeah, well, hey, we, we look we look forward to inviting you back in 2020 something uh, to have a flight in it. Thank you very much. I would love to take you off on that. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you again, Oliver, and have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, give us a five-star rating. And also, please subscribe, whether on your podcast app or on YouTube. And that way you can be the first to know about new episodes. Thank you very much and talk to you soon.